Our special guest today is Doberman Dan, who has been a direct response copywriter and serial entrepreneur for 33 years. Uh, he started four of his own nutritional supplement businesses and sold three of them. And as a copywriter, he specializes in health, fitness, and bodybuilding, but he's written in many other markets as well. Dan's work has appeared in Entrepreneur Magazine, Penthouse, Penthouse, hmm. <laughs> Investors Business Daily, The National Enquirer, and many other newspapers and magazines. He's host of Off the Chain Podcast, and he's been publishing the Doberman Dan Letter for the past nine years and counts many of the world's most successful marketers among its subscribers, including me. Today, we're going to take a wild ride through Dan's life, if you're still up for it. And are, are you still up for it, Dan? I, I'm still up for it, yes. Cool. Uh, wild ride through Dan's life and times and find out how his unusual experiences, and there are many, have contributed to what he knows and what he teaches about copywriting. And one thing I've found out about that I'd like to share is copy is powerful. You're responsible for how you use what you hear on this podcast. Most of the time, common sense is all you need. But if you make extreme claims and or if you're writing copy for offers in highly regulated industries like health, finance, and business opportunity, you may want to get a legal review after you write and before you start using your copy. My larger clients do this all the time. So, Dan, welcome. This has been a long time coming, and I'm so glad you're here. Well, thanks, Garf. I appreciate it. I, I've been looking forward to this. This is going to be a lot of fun. So thank you for inviting me. Ah, you're welcome. So let's jump right in. Um, I don't know. Where, where would you like to start? You were a cop once. I don't know. I did know a guy who had been a copywriter and later became a cop. Um, I figured that was because copywriter was too many letters and he just wanted to <laughs> read. But you've gone the opposite direction. You've added letters. You were a cop and, and now you're a copywriter. What, let's, can we talk about that? Talk about the persuasion and compliance lessons that you had to learn as a cop and how, if at all, that applies to copywriting? Sure. It was, you know, I think it was inevitable that I became a cop because since age seven, I immediately knew the only thing I ever wanted to do with my life and the only thing I ever had any interest in doing was being a professional musician. So I became a cop. I, oh, that oh. makes perfect sense. You want to connect the dots for the slower ones like me? You know? I, I just, you know, woulda, shoulda, coulda. I, no life planning was the problem. Like, you know, graduated from high school, and I would try to make a living playing music. And, you know, I really enjoy sleeping indoors and eating. And I just was not able to do that with music. So I, so I just stumbled from job to job. I like whatever I could get. And I got a, a first job I got for minimum wage, $3.35 an hour, was working at this rubber company in Akron, Ohio, that was on strike. I was the midnight security guard. And then I met some of the cops there that led to other jobs, like no life planning. So, you know, somebody said, hey, the city of Dayton, Ohio is giving a civil service exam for cop. And, and, you know, you're working in security now. Maybe you should do that. And I thought, yeah, OK. It's just like I stumbled into it, it was never anything I planned on doing. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to draw the connection. So cop on the beat. So I can see the the beat. The beat. <laughs> I, okay, it, it was no life planning. So persuasion. I mean, I, I have talked to other officers and I've been told that one of the biggest persuasion things you ha have to do is to convince a person to be arrested, right? You don't just slam them against the car like uh, on TV. L little did I know what I learned in that job would apply later in business and copywriting, but you know, the the police academy doesn't really teach you much of anything that's applicable on the street. They teach you what they need to teach you for liability purposes to keep the city from getting sued. Okay. But when you really learn is when you're just, I mean, you're thrown into the deep end of the water. You know, you just, it's like you show up for the beginner swimming class. They cut your leg open. You're bleeding all over the place. They throw you into a hundred foot water stocked with sharks with, 
freaking lasers on their heads. And that's when you learn. And so, Funny you, know, you should mention that. That's exactly how I learned to swim. Not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, t- talk about sink or swim, literally. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I was uh, I'm the same height I am now. At least I hope I'm the same height. I th- was five foot six then. I'm assuming I'm five foot six now. I was we, a buck we 40. generally tend to shrink when we get older. I don't, I don't Please think don't tell me that. You're not that Please, old. I, 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 can't, I can't afford. I was, I'm only five foot six. I can't afford to lose any more height, man. <laughs> All right. But I was a little guy, you know, a, a buck 40 soaking wet. And even with all the equipment on, you know, maybe a buck 45. And, you know, you had to figure out how to persuade these people that you were going to take the rights away, <laughs> put them in handcuffs and then put them in a, in a very confined space called jail. And you figure it out really darn quick or you get hurt a lot. So, you know, I learned a lot of lessons on the police department uh, that have applied to copywriting. One I learned, I didn't figure it out till decades later. I mean, I'd already left the police department. I was already, already writing copy, but, um, um, and I didn't even know the word for it, but I know it's, it's called now amygdala hijack that when somebody just gets in a rage or, or is in stark raving fear, the frontal lobe and all logical thinking is just shut down, man. It's like, this, it's not there. The amygdala takes over and that's, you know, the part of the brain that it's just fight or flight. It's the deer in the headlights. So you trying to reason with somebody in amygdala hijack is you're just wasting your time. And I figured out really fast that, you know, if you want to survive, you want to keep them from killing themselves, killing somebody else or killing you, the first thing you got to do is get them out of amygdala, amygdala hijack. And mm. there's very few things you can say or do that are going to do that based on logic. You've got to appeal to raw gut level emotion or just do something that's so shocking and such a pattern interrupt that the, it kind of elicits that, huh? Reaction and, and at least allows them to turn back on the frontal lobe to have a little logical thinking going on in their brain. Makes sense. You know, that's that saved my life a lot of times. It was years later that I figured out, I'll be darned. Like we do that in copy. The, these weird pattern interrupts at the beginning of a copy, uh, at the beginning at, at, in the leads, you know, that, that people used to do or, or still do. You know, like in some of the VSLs you've seen it has this shocking just pattern interrupt that just stops you dead in your tracks and makes you go, huh? Even if you've got, you know, 40 million text messages coming in. You're looking at your email. Somebody's talking to you. I figured out, I'll be darned. That's exactly what I used to do in the police department. So yeah, a lot of lessons that applied to copy. You don't um, remember any things that you said um, on the street as a cop or the, is that sworn of secrecy about that kind of stuff? I, I do. Uh, so one kind of became a, a, a macro for me. In other words, when I knew I was in a situation, this was life or death, this person is an amygdala hijack. And, you know, I, another thing I learned, uh, violence is actually rarely the answer. When it is the answer, it is the only answer. But there's a lot that can be done prior to you having to use deadly force. And, and a go-to macro, which was always the first one I ever tried, and this was based on uh, culture, you know, I, I got to understand the people as much as I could in the area where I was serving, I got to, I, I had to understand their culture, you know, because each, each area in each area of the country, there's a different cult, like the culture in the deep South is different than New York. The culture where I was working in Dayton, Ohio, was different than the culture I grew up in, in, in Northeastern Ohio and Barberton. So I got to understand the culture as much as I could. And a go-to macro when somebody's freaking out and is about to kill you or kill somebody, <laughs> my go-to was Jesus loves you. And it was like, you could almost see a change in countenance immediately. Wow. Cause it was like, huh? Jesus loves you. 
Uh, you know, and then at that point, it was usually improvisation took over. And so do I, brother. I, I, wanna, I, I don't want to see you hurt. We're going to resolve this for you. We're going to do whatever wow. it takes to make this right. But that was like a macro. That worked a lot. When that didn't work, <laughs> uh, usually violence was the next resort. There's like, it was, like I said, violence is rarely the, the answer. There's a lot of stuff you can do, but that one worked a lot. It's just shocking. It's, it's like they don't expect it. They're freaking out. They're, you know, they've lost it. They're in amygdala hijack, and it's just a shocking statement that just for some reason at least reactivated the frontal lobe or brought down the amygdala hijack or something. Well, when you say this, is, that's such great stuff, Dana. I, I can't even begin to respond. So I'm going to tell you about one reaction I had when you said violence is rarely the answer. For some reason, I remember an old Gary Halbert letter where he talks about a guy who walks into a bar with a 50 pound bag of lime on his back and throws it up into the air to start a bar fight. Um, I don't know why that, uh, came to mind, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, you did something to get on, on Halbert's radar and Barberton sounds a lot like where Gary grew up, wasn't it? Yeah. He, he grew up in Barberton, Ohio. Also, we didn't, we didn't know each other. He, he, you know, he, what was Gary? Gary was 20 years older than me, but so he had moved out, uh, by the time of there, but yeah, he, he grew up in Barberton, so did I. So here's, here's what I did to get on Halbert's radar. Um, I found out about him because I, I, you know, I had subscribed to Dan Kennedy's newsletter since the early 90s, I guess. And, and Dan was from around that part of Northeastern Ohio too, wasn't he? Yeah, close, closer to Cleveland. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, and he had done some work for Halbert, actually. Kennedy had written some copy for Gary Halbert. So Kennedy talked about Halbert in his newsletter, and I subscribed to Howard's newsletter, and I just, something about him really clicked with me. Um, and I thought, man, if I could, you know, if I could learn from this guy, I think I could maybe kind of leapfrog over the learning curve that I'm trying to go through now. So I just used, he had this, uh, he published a newsletter one month about how to get the attention of a VIP. And I just used exactly what he published in his newsletter to get on his radar. And I used our Barberton connection to do that. So, so what I did was I typed up this fake article, uh, newspaper article, and had it formatted to look like it was on the front page of the Barberton Herald, the newspaper for Barberton, wow. Ohio. <laughs> and the article was about, you know, these two guys from Barberton, Ohio, uh, form a partnership and start working on uh, 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 mail order and copywriting projects together. And they make so much money that they buy the city of Barberton and turn it into the world's largest parking lot. Which, <laughs> That's hilarious. Which, which Gary and I both agreed would would have been if we could have done that would have been an improvement but uh <laughs> so I, I put it in a real nice frame uh and fedexed it to his office and got a phone call from him right right after he got it you know and he thanked me he said hey, it's really creative and then i just like every month i would send some sort of creative thing like that and that started the conversation you know that, that's that's how i got on his radar and that's how we got the conversation going and then eventually working together. I, I just used his technique that he taught and it worked on him. <laughs> well, okay. So you're saying that like, God, that's so obvious, but I, I'm, I'm trying to put myself in Gary's head, which is hard and, and scary. And I'm, I'm no Gary, <laughs> but, but nevertheless, uh, one thing I, I do remember him talking about that I've experienced a lot myself when I'm mentoring people or, or teaching is getting someone to actually follow your instructions or getting someone to actually take you up in an idea without, you know, totally screwing it up so they can say, this was my idea because it's different. That's rare. That's the kind of person you want to work with. I mean, does that make sense to you? It, it makes total sense. I mean, they're demonstrating that, I mean, first of all, they got, they got a little, how's it pronounced? Ch chutzpah? Chutzpah. chutzpah. I think the word you're looking for is sechel. 
which means, but chutzpah for sure. Exactly. And, you know, now my preference is everybody sends an email. You know, I, I, I like to say any idiot can send an email and many idiots do. And it's like, there's no creative thought required for that. And everybody's inbox is overloaded and it just doesn't get attention. But, you know, if you put some thought into this and send a package like that with what I call theater, I mean, that, that gets somebody's attention. At least they think, hey, this guy's got something on the ball. You know, maybe I should, maybe this is somebody I should communicate with. Yeah. So uh, what did you get out of working with Halbert? I mean, I've, I've heard so many other people, Caleb and Carlton and uh, many others uh, talk about things they've learned from. I have a feeling you probably learned different things than most people. Am I right? Yeah, because, well, based on one of his newsletters, I read the newsletter. It was about Costa Rica. And I sent him a fax and he called me. I said, hey, I got some questions about Costa Rica. And he answered them. And 30 days later, I sent him another message and said, hey, based on our conversation, I sold everything I had and moved there. Sight unseen. <laughs> <laughs> How do you spell impulsive? <laughs> exactly. Uh, the fact that it was winter in Ohio was a good convincing factor for doing that too. Sure. Um, and his reaction was like, holy crap, you did something that impulsive based on a newsletter. Right? Yeah, I did. And so he goes, hey, next time I'm there, because he, he visited Costa Rica, he had a girlfriend there. He said, let's, let's have dinner, which we did. And then came back like a month later and said, hey, could I crash at your place for the weekend? I said, sure you can. And he wound up staying there for like four months. Wow. So, so yeah, I mean, we, I spent a lot of time with him. And then after that, he convinced me to move back to the States and live in the same building as him. He had a client apartment is what he called it. And in his main apartment. Was so then I lived in Miami or Key West. Yeah. That was in Miami. Yeah. So I got to spend a lot of time with him. I've learned so many things with him, uh, from him. You know, what was most interesting is like, he never, this wasn't like a typical teaching or, or mentoring session. Like you sit down and here's lesson one. Here's lesson. He didn't make he just carry tray, you know, trays of, of letters to the post office. Like he did with a lot of his mentees. Actually we did not. Okay. We did that once we did carry letters to the post office, but he just let me observe his life. He never directly taught me anything. He just let me observe as we did the things we need to do. The most important thing that Halbert did for me was um, I was already like somewhat successful as a copywriter back then. I had, you know, I had already started a business driven by my own copy and that business was successful enough to get me free of the police department. Mm -hmm. um, but what working with him just, I think, allow me to leapfrog over what normally would have been a lot longer learning curve. I'm guessing at this, and I can't say this is for sure, but I think my learning curve probably would have been instead of the, like the, 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 the year the, the couple years I worked with him, I think that would have normally been a 10 year learning curve without him, maybe even longer. Do you think that he just observing him and the way he operated allowed you to think bigger? Oh yeah, for sure. And it allowed me to see like some of the, the some of the ways I was approaching stuff was probably not ideal. Like for example, so I like when it was time to write copy, um, I'd, I'd research stuff and then just while I, while I'm researching, I'd be writing. And then after the research, I just start writing. And um, I mean, I could make it work, but it wasn't ideal. What I found with him is, and again, he didn't teach me this. He just let me observe. Like we got, we got a copy gig. He read all the research and then said, you know, you, you got to be at my apartment at eight o'clock. It's nose to the grindstone, you know, eight o'clock. You'll be lucky if you leave at 8 PM. We'll probably be here till midnight. Nose to grass. <laughs> so every day I showed up and he's like, ah, let's go get coffee. And then after that, like, Hey, I want to buy a new blues CD. Let's go to the music store. Just, 
this is dates me. That's back when there were actually were music stores. Um, you know, and after that, it's like, Hey, uh, I got to do, so, I got to buy some supplies for the boat. Then it's like, Hey, let's putz around on the boat. And then every day, you know, we get back at six o'clock. He's like, um, I'm going to take a nap. Then I'm going to watch TV. This went on for weeks. And I'm thinking, man, we took money from the client and shouldn't we be nose to the grindstone? Like he said, and one, you know, and so one day after weeks, literally weeks of this, it might've been close to a month. We're out on the boat and he just like, he's just not, he's not with me. He's not in the present with me he's somewhere else. And he just says, turn the boat around. We're going home. And he didn't say anything. So we went and docked the boat. He didn't say anything. We went back up to his apartment and he just sat down and started writing. And from start to finish, he wrote that whole sales letter out at one time. And I, and I never asked him about this because I just, I just immediately knew what it was. Those four weeks or whatever it was, three and a half, four weeks that I thought we were screwing around and I was constantly worried that entire time because we weren't working. That was his percolation. That what was necessary to allow that stuff to combine in whatever new ways it needed to combine to get the breakthrough big idea he needed. And if we would have started writing before that, well, you know, we, the, the big idea hadn't come yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's fascinating. That's like, that's like the best story I've heard all year. Of course it's early in the year. No, that's one of the best <laughs> stories ever heard about creativity. What do you call it when somebody's pregnant? Gestation? Gestation. Yeah. Yeah. The gestation process. I mean, we talk about like, oh, what's his name? You know, one of my favorite go-to stories is legendary. I don't know. It's not verified about um, uh, Mike Palmer at, at uh, Stansbury, where he sits and he reads 25 books for six months and then he writes The End of America. That's cool. That works for him. But, you know, doesn't work for everybody in every situation. And God, I, you know, I heard about a guy, heard the second hand that he's working for a really big company right now as a copywriter, and they have a freaking timer and monitor on his computer so they know how many minutes he's sitting there pounding keys. And they're just shooting themselves in the financial foot by doing that, in my opinion, you know, trying to constantly keep him busy and tracked and productive because, yeah, it's true when it comes time. I mean, I bet when he sat down and he started writing, it's like, if you said anything, he'd pull out a gun and blow your head off. But um, am I right? More or less? Oh yeah, Metaphor. for sure. But until then it's like, yeah, let's go out in the boat, have a beer, smoke a doobie, whatever. Right. Um, Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you about something else. We're both guitarists. Well, you're a real one and I'm still pretending. Um, you struggled for a long time learning jazz improv on guitar, which is, you know, one of the hardest things known to humankind as far as I can tell. And what was the psychological lesson you've learned that can help someone get good at copywriting fast or even guitar. Well, you know, woulda, shoulda, coulda. I wish I would've learned this 30 years ago. By the way, I've, I, I'm still struggling, struggling with jazz improvisation, but I've, but I've had some breakthroughs. And um, what it was is like, so I, I already knew how to play guitar. And, and I, th I think I was pretty good in the rock idiom, in pop music uh, and stuff like that. You know, and it's, it's just, it's not as harmonically complex as jazz. And then I wanted to do this jazz, I wanted to learn jazz and especially jazz fusion, you know, the, the jazz with the rock edge. And so I, I asked around and everybody's like, well, you got to go to Berkeley, man, like Berkeley College of Music in Boston or Musicians Institute in L.A., um, you got to go to really good music school. You got to study theory. You got to know all this music theory backwards and forwards. And that, that wasn't an option to me, option for me. So I started studying theory on my own for decades. I, I don't know how much money I spent on courses and stuff like that. And I still sucked 
at jazz. <laughs> this went on literally for decades. Right. Three but decades. Could, but you could talk about the Lydian mode like nobody's business, right? Oh, my God. I could talk about the theory and the modes and, and modal interchange and, and, and extended uh, triads and, and superimposing triads over chords to get all these uh, different harmonies. And, and so finally, I'm like, this, I, I still suck. And there was a player, there's a, a guitarist who's won national jazz competitions. I'm sorry, international jazz competitions. who doesn't live too far from me in Tampa. And he's a professor of music uh, down there at the university. And so he does private lessons and I paid him for a private lesson. And he's, he's like, okay, so like, show me what you know. And he is that, you know, let's talk about this. We talked about theory and then go, go let's play over this, something like autumn leaves, you know, basic jazz standard. Mm -hmm. And he goes, I'm going to show you something that's going to change your life. And he goes, how long you been, how long you been trying to learn jazz? I'm like, well, 30 years now is I'm going to show you something that's going to change your life. And he goes over to the closet and pulls out this three ring binder like super thick three ring binder and he plops it on the table is this is my lick book he goes i've been keeping this for years anytime i hear a musician you know it doesn't have to be a guitarist saxophonist piano player doesn't matter when they play a phrase that i like here's what i do i listen to it over and over and over till i get it in my head and um and then till i get to the point where i can sing it so then i sing it and then I figured out all my instrument, you know, and copy it as best as I can. And then I write it in the book and then I practice it over and over till I'm fluent with it. And so I have all these snippets. It's like learning a language. I have these words or these phrases and I can piece them together in sentences because you never need another lesson from me. That's what you need to be doing. That's what you should have been doing all this time because you know music theory better than I do, and I'm a professor of music, but you still suck at jazz improvisations because you didn't do this. And I had this immediate realization like, I must be a complete idiot because that is how I learned copy. I didn't have time to study the theory of it or read books about it. I just took copy, the copy that I, the only copy I had available at the time, which was in Dan Kennedy's magnetic marketing system. Mm -hmm. and modeled that and used it to create copy for my own self-published bodybuilding course. And I was able to make money with it immediately. I thought, and I'll be darned, like, that's how I learned copy. That's, that's how I should have learned jazz improvisation. If I would have done what I did with guitar, with copy, here I'd be, I, I, it'd be, I, I started writing copy over 25 years ago. I'd still be reading theory about it and probably still working for the damn police departments at one of these days, I'm going to be able to write copy to get me free of this. You, you know, I'm, that's such a great story. I'm wondering how true it is. This insight occurred to me. People who actually get things done and accomplish things in the world never have enough time to, quote, do it right. I, I don't know if I'd call it shortcuts or, or learning accelerators or what, whatever it is, but that, that whole academic model outside of the world of, of academics, it's, it, 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 can, it can be like multiple albatrosses around your neck. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. It's just sometimes ready, fire, aim is just the best approach. And, you know, I'm not against studying. I think studying copy is great. I still do it. You know, I, I buy all kinds of books and courses on copywriting. But, but you know, just the actual doing of how it used to say to write out copy by hand, you know, mm -hmm. um, the actual doing of it. You see something in a piece of copy you like or a headline you like you know, write it down and figure out how you can use that right now. I mean, let's, let's not swipe stuff word for word, but you know, you can, you can take that stuff and be writing successful copy right now, just by modeling it. You can figure out the theory of it later. I mean, that, you know, that's, that's what I should have been doing with jazz improvisation. Ooh, I like that phrase. I'm going to copy that phrase and play it. Later, if I want to, I'll figure out why it works over those cores, or maybe I don't even want to know.
because it doesn't matter if I can play it and it sounds good. It doesn't matter if I understand the theory. I think we have time for one, one more quick bit. You were uh, sort of dangling out there that you have a reason you never have to worry about getting clients ever again. Would you be willing to share it with us? I think everyone would like to know that. Here's my secret. And, and that is, and it's no big secret, really. It's being a copywriter really isn't so much about the writing. The writing is just a means to an end. You're a salesperson is what you really are. And if you understand how to sell and print, well, then the, if you need clients, the, the first thing you need to be selling is yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, write a letter to sell yourself and then do some creative stuff, like send that letter with theater, like we were talking about, like how I got the attention of Halbert, you know? A great example is this. One of, one of my newsletter subscribers uh, took what I taught in a newsletter and, and did this with Agora Financial. And he wrote a letter selling himself. And he did not send it in an email because I said, if you want to be ignored and never have clients, then go ahead and send it in an email. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you want to make sure that you're going to get the attention of the right people, do this. Um, send them, uh, deliver it by a, a courier service in a metal Halliburton briefcase that's locked. <laughs> Special. It's even better if it's a Brinks truck, you know, and the guard shows up and it's handcuffed to his hand, shows up, you know, uh, a special delivery for Joe Schrieffer. Joe Schrieffer's the, the head guy in charge of hiring copywriters there. Sure. Special delivery for Joe Schrieffer. They deliver it. And he's got a locked Halliburton briefcase. A, 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 an hour later, a, a FedEx arrives for Joe Schrieffer, you know, and it says, Joe, here's the code to open open the Halliburton briefcase. He opens the Halliburton briefcase. There's a letter from a copywriter selling himself along with a prepaid telephone with that copywriter's number programmed in and said, call me immediately after you read this message. And you know what Joe said? By the way, that guy got a job there. Joe yeah. said, the letter was almost irrelevant. The letter was good. He goes, but the letter was almost irrelevant. I didn't even have to read it. I thought anybody who's this creative and can think that outside the box, that's somebody I want to work with. You know, so if you're waiting around for clients or you're sending emails, you might be waiting around for a really long time. You know, you know how to sell yourself, sell yourself and do it creatively with theater. That is, that is so awesome. I'm just imagining the Brinks guard with the, I've, I've been to Joe's office. I can see Joe, you know, who's like always on schedule, very organized. And, and <laughs> sky walks. <laughs> and I could just, that's brilliant. Well, thank you. You've given us about 10 podcasts worth of value in one podcast. What can we do for you? What, and what do you have for our listeners if they're interested in finding out more about Doberman Dan? Oh, well, I appreciate that opportunity. So the, the, the main source for finding out about me is my website at, at DobermanDan.com. I, I think you're going to see something unusual there that you don't see on many websites. I, I have a different approach to online business these days that's quite contrarian. So I think uh, if anybody decides to opt in there, they'll be educated on a, 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 high, a contrarian yet highly effective way to do business online. And there's a, there's a ton of free articles on there too. And to your, let's it's, it's stage left to your right. There's a book right next to the printer it says um, just sell the damn thing. You want to tell us about that? Oh yes. So that's, that's my contrarian secret. That book is about that this whole way of doing business that I found has been way more effective for me online and for a lot of different businesses. As far as customer quality, client quality, um, I've been, and many of my clients have been much more successful using what I call the just sell the damn thing system, which is, uh, do I believe in uh, providing content and building a relationship with people? 
I do only when it's the right people. And in most cases, the right people are buyers. Uh, free stuff is just so ubiquitous online anymore. You just get lost in, in the mire when you follow the free mind. I'm going to give you a bunch of free stuff and we're going to stack it on, build a relationship before we ask for a sale. I've, I've found a lot of problems in that particular model. So if you do go you to DobermanDan.com, you'll see it. You mean the let me devalue myself before you so you'll want to pay me a lot of money model? That one? It, exactly. It's like, what are you saying about the value of your intellectual property when you give it away free to any freebie seeking mooch with their handout? Yeah, it's, you know, you, you are devaluating something that like, like in our case, it has taken us decades to figure this stuff out, you know? And by giving it away free, we are doing th those people a great disservice because free is not valued, nor is it ever acted upon. And in, in the book, you know, I cite all kinds of studies backing that up, even MRI studies of the brain, um, a university level studies of this. Um, that's why I think if, if anybody goes to DobermanDan.com, they're going to see this model in action. Well, if you like what you've heard so far, you should go to DobermanDan.com because there's a lot more of it and, and some pretty cool opportunities. Thank you, David. I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to promote that. You're welcome. Hey, thanks for coming on. This is, we've, we've actually had a lot of really great conversations, but this may be the first one we've had in public. That, that's a great, and recorded, because some of our previous conversations, it's a darn good thing there's no permanent record. Well, I'll say. <laughs> Thank the electronic gods for that. <laughs> hey, Dan, are you still doing the Off the Chain podcast? I am not, pub no, I'm not um, publishing any new podcasts. The, the old ones are still up, and my producer... He said he was going to leave them up for a year, but I, I, when did I stop doing that? I stopped doing that sometime in 2019. As much as I enjoyed it, I just got um, overwhelmed with too many other projects and I had to put it on hold indefinitely. I saw a poll and you actually have one of the 14 best podcast voices in the world. <laughs> I'm afraid I've not seen that poll. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't remember where it was. If people do want to check out the old episodes of it while they're still available, do you have a place where they can go? It's, uh, it's on iTunes. It's called Off the Chain with Doberman Dan. And holy smokes, I forget my own URL. I think it's offthechainshow.com also. Or um, on dobermandan.com, all the podcasts are on there. There's a, there's a subcategory that you can click on that says podcasts and they're still on there. And real quick before we're out of here, cause I used to be an avid listener of the podcast until you stopped doing it. You often mentioned a, a Knights of the round table type thing. Is that still active? And can you tell people what that is? Oh, that that's still active. I'm now in my 10th year of doing it. It started out. So it started out as just a, a good old fashioned print newsletter. And then it, it morphed into a, a, an online membership site with content. It's all about uh, entrepreneurship and, and marketing and copywriting. And the, I also do a, a, a monthly uh, webinar, like open counseling slash Q and a webinar for my nights. Uh, every month. And so, yeah, that's, that's, you can find out about that at marketingcamelot.com. Um, and that's like my passion sharing those lessons. And everybody says like print newsletter. Oh my gosh, that's so passe. So obsolete. Um, the print newsletter has been the key to the whole thing, man. Uh, delivering stuff in print just makes a deeper imprint in the brain. In fact, I, I cite the MRI studies about that in my book, Just Sell a Damn Thing. So yeah, I'm, st I'm still doing that. I don't, like I said, I call them knights. They're not subscribers. So uh, that term, by the way, I, term, I, I swiped that from Gary Halbert because 
he wrote in a sales letter something about, it's like, a, I envision it as a marketing Camelot with me attracting, you know, all the best people to me around the, around, or the round table. And I thought, oh, dude, that's what I'm going to call my deal, the marketing Camelot. I like that. So I don't have subscribers. I have nights. Nice. David, anything else before we're out of here? No, I just want to say thanks. Thanks again, Dan. And we got to catch up before too long. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for the invite, Garf. I appreciate it. Nathan, thanks again. I appreciate you guys letting me mention my stuff. Sure. <laughs> I really do. I, I, I'm, I, I'm excited about uh, uh, people getting into my world if, if they resonate with me. I realize not everybody resonates with me, but I appreciate the opportunity to, to mention that. Very cool. This, this was an awesome show. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, for coming on. Thank you, David, for putting this together and some stuff that I want to mention before we're out of here. If you want more episodes of this podcast, head on over to copywriterspodcast.com and we will catch you next time.